Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike and Davina, and thank you so much for being here with me today. Today, my guest is Ivana Manley, and if you're not familiar with her, she is the president and co-founder of Manley Laboratories, who are makers of incredible gear, such as preamps, EQs, uh, compressors, a whole bunch of high-end stuff that you'll typically find in a lot of really big studios, and even in a lot of home studios these days, because the quality of this gear is just so incredible. And so I brought her on the show today to talk about some of the gear that Manley has been making, and you know what really sets it apart, but also to go into a deeper conversation about tubes, because tubes play a really big part in a lot of the Manly gear. So just to get a sense of, you know, why tubes are so important, what applications they have, you know, why it's worth getting gear that has tubes in it, that kind of stuff. So Ivana, she works with tubes every single day. So I figured she's the expert at this kind of stuff. So let's bring her on and get into the nitty gritty when it comes to that kind of stuff. So with that said, let's just jump right into our interview. Ivana Manly, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. How are you today? It is my pleasure to be here. Thanks, Mike. No problem. For people who might not know you and your story, can you give us that background on how you got into music and ultimately to where you are today running Manly Labs? Well, yeah, like I like to say, I started out like a a total band geek in high school and, uh, you know, from elementary school and then into high school. And I, I really loved music theory and the whole, all the band experience in high school. And, um, so I went to, I went off to college at Columbia University and I was studying music. And there was um, that one day, that one person influenced my life. And that was Bill Graham, the concert promoter, the Fillmore East, Fillmore West, Bill Graham, who, you know, basically started the whole San Francisco music scene. Well, his son was in my class. So he came and taught a class that one day and he was sitting right in front of me explaining the music industry to us. And I made a decision that day, like, oh my goodness, I'm going to take next semester off. I'm going to drive across the country. I'm going to go find Bill Graham Presents in San Francisco and try to talk myself into a job. That was my plan. (laughs) And the other influence was my stepfather, Al Doré, who owned Ampeg in the late 60s. And so the SVT was created under his under his uh, presidential leadership at, at the Unum Music Company. So he owned Ampeg, and he owned Grammar guitar and Dan Armstrong guitar and Emmon Steel guitar. And, um, you know, he was building a conglomerate in the music industry and became quite successful with wow. it. Well, as it turned out, his, his first wife died of alcoholism and he kind of lost his marbles and went bankrupt, sold the company to Magnavox, went, did some bad deals, went bankrupt. And then he met my mother. So, I didn't grow up with any Ampeg stuff except for the stories. Ah. But uh, where he circles back to me when I was in college was, you know, there was just no way he was going to be able to to pay for next semester of college and my sister's next semester of college. So I also that was another factor. Like I, I needed to go work and go earn some money so I could complete my education. So those were the two influences there. So what happened was I, I drove out to California in my red Volkswagen Beetle. And um, my dad gave me a couple names of some Ampeg guys that had worked for him 20 years prior. And so I called the first guy who did not pick up the phone. This is 1989. <laughs> there's no cell phones. There's no pagers. There's no, you know, you either pick the up beeper, the phone yeah. or you don't. <laughs> And then the second guy on the list, Roger Cox, was at Fender. He put me in touch with the Manleys out in Calif- in uh, Chino, California. So he introduced them to me as these two crazy South Africans building two amplifiers in Chino. And I was like, wow, that's weird. But I'll go check it out. So that's what I did. And I got hired just on the ground floor, just, just starting to learn how to solder and wire up amplifiers and put things together. So oh, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you if you had any sort of experience with building equipment or any sort of technical knowledge of that stuff before for, before getting into it. I always was really good working with my hands, um, playing instruments. You have to be dexterous, right? And uh, 
I had zero electronic experience when I went into that job. It just, it just wasn't something we didn't have like robot clubs in high school back then. We didn't even have computers to speak of, you know? So I don't know. Electronics was just not um, a hobby that anyone I knew growing up was into. And, and it, there was, I, I didn't even know if there was like an electronics hobby class at, in high school or something. I don't think there was. Maybe AV club, but those were the super nerds in AV club, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was totally an AV club guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, back in the 80s, it was incredibly way nerdier than us nerdy band people. In fact, some yeah. people did double it band in AV club, but that was more nerdy than I knew about back then. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, you know, once I got into, um, into building, you know, building board, stepping boards and soldering and stuff. And then, um, I really used my early, uh, youth excitement and enthusiasm and, and some knowledge from high school jobs to help start improving the company. Cause there was a real lack of like business systems in the early vacuum tube logic of America factory, which was the first factory that Manly was started within in 1988, actually. So I, uh, you know, like set up an inventory system and a purchasing system. And, and then I worked my way towards quality control bench. So I had my own electronics bench, started figuring out how these things work or how they don't work and, uh, fixing things and prototyping and, and helping David with the new designs and, and so on. So. Yeah, when I when I talk about starting at the ground floor, that I'm really serious about that for sure. Yeah, it sounds like I mean you you had never it sounded like you had never even soldered before, and then you just, never. So, never. so yeah, that's 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 pretty much going all the way from the bottom to the top, right? <laughs> like, that's right. Yep. <laughs> that's and, amazing. And I I just want to you know re- remind younger people that it's totally possible, and it's a great idea to put your pride on hold while you're in a new position in a new company somewhere and just start being a sponge and absorb, absorb things, you know, and it's hard to do that. If you've got this preconception that you're going to walk into some new company and be the, you know, you know, make 150 grand a year and (laughs) skip the runner part. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, keep that humility. You'll you'll go a lot further with it than without it in my in my experience. For sure. Well, I mean, it sounds like you you took the time, you you learned from the ground up and you you spotted the gaps in the business and and you were able to identify areas that you could offer your expertise or or offer a different perspective on things and and you know, that's just that's a great way to show your value to a company and and to ultimately work your way up all the way, right? Yeah, you know, um, when I'm coaching, I, I do a lot of speed mentoring with Karen Dunn and we, we've, you know, helped out kids from Crass and Berkeley and USC and all kinds of kids around the world and mostly college kids. And I, I always give kids this advice, um, when they're trying to apply for a job, you know, being as one who's read a lot of resumes in her career. Well, first off, you know, make sure your resume has all the words spelled correctly and, <laughs> and has all the punctuation in place and it reads well, you know, because in a precise job like electronics manufacturing, every resistor is important. Every value has to be what it's prescribed to be, right? You can't just stick a hundred ohm resistor in there when the circuit's expecting a million ohms, right? Even though the difference looking at that resistor is one color stripe, you know, <laughs> it's, you, you have to have everything correct. And, or if you're writing code or something, you know, you have to have, this isn't jazz <laughs> where you can bend a note, you know, you have, to, if you don't put that semicolon at the end of that code, the whole thing won't work. And then you're spending hours looking for like, where, why isn't this working? So you know, be precise with your communication, be precise and accurate with your resume. And then importantly, when you apply for a job, the best way that you'll get that job is if you explain to your future employer what you can do for them. Okay. 
don't walk into a, some company or a studio and, and say, Hey, I need a job because everyone <laughs> needs a job and their, their job is not to serve you. Your future job will be to serve the company. So best you start off by explaining what you can do for that company. And that's, believe me, if someone came to me and said, Hey, I can do those things that you're doing and take them off your plate. And I'll do them better than you're doing them. I'll be like, oh, yeah, please take this stuff off my plate. I'm done with this. You know what I mean? Yeah, so absolutely. that's how you get yourself a job. Demonstrate how you can be useful to that studio or to that company. Of course. And that 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 applies regardless of industry, really. Like you just have to show your value. It, it's funny, too, because like I feel like in the and I'm curious to get your opinion on this as someone who's hired a lot of people. You know, it, a lot of times when we talk about internships, I hear a lot of bigger engineers will say, like, if you're going to be an intern at a studio, like your job is just to like shut up and like listen and just do the job. But there is also that 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 line of like, OK, well, like I I have value I can add or like that kind of thing. So how do you straddle that? Like, wh what advice do you have for people that, that are in that kind of position, whether it's an internship at a studio or working for someone else? Like there is that fine line of like maybe overstepping your boundaries. Right. Well, I. I don't want to walk in the factory and see somebody who's just sitting there on their phone, right? Even that wouldn't be appropriate. You're not, you're not listening. You're not helping. You're not, you know, you're basically goofing off and that's a good reason to fire you. Right. So you can't be a total wallflower. It's in my view, it's best if you again, demonstrate how you can be useful to the company. Maybe somebody in the creative process in a studio can't deal with your presence at all. Like they're really trying to concentrate on, on developing the song and producing the record or whatever they're doing. And that might be cause where you do need to just be quiet with your hands in your clasp and, and just be ready to anticipate what does that engineer or producer need next? That's fine. But don't be on your phone all distracted where you're not even paying attention. Because if you're paying attention, you can learn something. Of course. And then if, if you have to judge, like if it's not appropriate to just be looming over the guy's shoulder or whatever, or gal's shoulder, then go get busy doing something useful. Like, you know, coil up some wires or sweep or go clean the toilet or something that improves the environment. Go make some coffee, whatever it is. Yeah, there's always something so, to do. There's always something to do. And so in my case, like what I saw needed doing was like we had no purchasing system in the company. I mean, this is so far back. And so we didn't really have computers. So I started with a ruler and a Sharpie and I, I made a grid and I, I copied the pages and punched holes in them and made a little binder and handed it to Luke and said, here's your new purchasing system. So now you don't have to remember if you ordered that those capacitors or not. You'll have a log of it and you'll have a log of what price you paid for. I mean, these days we do all that stuff in the computer and that piece of paper became Excel and became FileMaker database later and all that. But I wasn't sitting around, you know, talking on the phone. I was thinking, I was looking around and thinking, what can I do to help improve this company? And then, of course, I became very valuable to the company, right? So. Of course. That's that's it it's just a, it's really more an attitude adjustment or a perspective adjustment. I think that sometimes um some potential candidates could use, you know, where where they walk in, I need more money. I need a job. It's like I'm I'm not here to serve you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do for me to warrant that more money or even a job, right? For sure. I think that that applies to so many areas and it's not just for people who are seeking jobs right now. It's like, it's just showing your value as a, as a person to someone else, you know, and relationship building and all that. It's like, you know, you're, you have to be supportive of each other and you're not, it's not just a one-sided thing. You know, you're always, you're always working with people and collaborating. Right. So it's super important. Exactly. Yeah. So for you, like you hadn't had any experience in electronics and then you were, you were fortunate that you got this job and you were able to watch people or have people tell you like, okay, do this, do that. Where, where should one start these days if they're looking to get into electronics? Like, is there any resources well, that you would this, say? Yeah, there's this great thing called the internet. I don't know if you've <laughs> heard of it, but 
there's so much information out there and i i've totally gone down youtube rabbit holes um you know like arduino classes there's free arduino classes online and i i did one i i went through one i bought a little kit just like they had on on the on youtube and went through it step by step with that one instructor and and use a breadboard and put some things together because I I didn't know a lot about some of those other you know solid state things. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean. Um, so it was really fun, like learning from the ground up, and also trying to remember my high school algebra. You know, when graphing slopes to write a formula to do this in the computer to to you know measure this thing or whatever. And I learned so much doing that. You know, in my fifties. Just following along a course on YouTube. I think it's super valuable. And there are a lot of really cool geeks. I, I also go down these rabbit holes of watching like machinists and, you know, I've got a machine shop at Manly Labs, but usually I'm drawing something and handing it to someone to do, you know. Um, but it's really great to like start learning machining. That's my next hobby, <laughs> I think. That's very cool. Yeah. I'll, always <laughs> keep actually, learning. To actually do it, you know, to be able to work my my lathe and my bridge boards. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. But yeah, there's a, you can learn a lot. Um, I think YouTube's a great resource. And, and of course there's these old fashioned things called books and, and so on. But, um, what's accessible, I think are, are these YouTube channels. Definitely. For sure. And I've even seen, there's a lot of like DIY gear companies that you can buy like a guitar pedal kit or preamp kits or that kind of thing. And it's like, those are, they're kind of like soldering by numbers to some degree, right? So you kind of, you get a, a little bit of the concept of it by, by following those kind of ideas and, and, and it's rewarding to be able to say, yeah, I built this. That that's, kind of thing. that's how I would start. If I had to start today, that's where I, if I were 18 years old today, it's where I'd be starting definitely. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'd love to talk about some of the manly equipment and, and some of the stuff that you do. And um, one thing that I definitely know is a big part of the manly sound and a lot of the, a lot of the gear that you guys build is tubes. And so I'm just curious, like, this is maybe a, a, a loaded question here, but what is so special about tube gear? And why is it that people should like it? <laughs> because tubes rule. We like vacuum <laughs> tubes because they they have high headroom. And they're, there's, you know, people sometimes think of tubes like, oh, they're warm and crunchy and distorted. Yeah, maybe in a guitar amplifier where you're paying them to be warm and crunchy and distorted, you know. But notice that type of distortion, you know, when, when you're pushing a guitar amplifier super hard to get it to distort on purpose, listen to how beautiful that distortion sounds. It sounds awesome. Like you want that distortion. So again, when you're dealing with high headroom, high voltage vacuum tube circuits that purport high fidelity, if you were to get near the clipping point, it would be a very graceful onset of clipping, not abrupt. So, um, you know, you've got so much headroom to deal with and you're not going to go crunchy, crunchy and sound horrible that way. Another thing, like with our tube circuits, again, talking about distortion products, uh, we use quite a few single ended circuits and those naturally will give you even order harmonic structure distortion, which is again, more pleasing to the ear than odd order harmonic distortion so that's another, another thing and then like the type of components that we use around the vacuum tubes the vacuum tubes themselves don't really have a whole lot of sound themselves it's everything else around them like the transformers or the capacitors you know nice film capacitors or something like that so when you're dealing with high impedance circuits which we commonly do with vacuum tube circuits then we're using a much smaller value capacitor. And so we can use like a, a really good sounding film capacitor as opposed to needing more microfarads that you can only get in a tantalum or an electrolytic capacitor that doesn't sound as good, you know, pound for pound. So there's, there's a couple things like that, but really what, what we're promoting and what we've embraced with our new switch mode power supply is reminding people it's high voltage, it's high headroom and high fidelity. So that's, that's why we like vacuum tube circuits. Gotcha. Yeah, it's interesting because I've, I always hear people talk about tubes 
uh, especially with regards to like guitar amps and it, it is about the saturation and the distortion and that seems to be kind of one of those qualities that people say they always the buzzwords are always like it sounds warm it's it saturates really nicely so it there's always this kind of association i feel of tubes with saturation of some degree but manly gear isn't something that i would ever think to use for distortion like it's it's very clean very clean gear generally right and like you said it's got yeah. that high headroom so so is it it's just a matter of like the components in the chain that make make that tube able to distort or is it the different types of tubes or circuit choice um of course you know all components are scrutinized we also have you know well over 30 years of history with the types of parts that we tend to use and um you know, we, we've already proven to ourselves that, you know, th this capacitor sounds better than this one or whatever. So, um, yeah, we've got a, a big bag of tricks up our sleeves, you know, from so many years of history. And, and listening tests I did maybe 30 years ago, that's what I'm saying, are, are still valid today. You know, I, I tell a story where one day I went down to Jackson Brown studio with, um, it was actually a, a D to A converter with a tube output stage that we were making at the time. And it was a, you know, simple cascade into a white follower output stage. And that output capacitor on the white follower is critical to the whole sound of the whole circuit because everything's going through that one cap, right? And that cap's like the size of a dinner roll, big old, big old capacitor. So um at the time we were using like a wema cap bypass with a photo flash electrolytic capacitor and so that day I, I brought a whole bag of capacitors down to the studio we were playing a master tape it was just really pretty amazing to get to do this one of jackson's master tapes we're playing it or you know master uh, ma sorry it was like a cd rep or something like that i forget what it was um it, it was, it wasn't a commercial release CD, put it that way. It was okay. some kind of digital master thing. I forget what it was now. Um, and we're playing back the tape, the source through this D to A. It was an all train analog D to A through this tube stage. And we'd play a bit and there were three or four of us in the studio listening. And then we'd stop, unsolder that capacitor and put in the next choice in there. And then play the same song again. And we, we all picked this, this multi cap as being the superior sounding capacitor that day. And the difference between that and what we were using is like, God damn, that sounds really murky and muddy. So, you know, I, I just remember getting really good listening training in my early years, you know, going to audiophile shows, doing double blind listening. We also still are also very, um, involved with the audiophile world and we do you know so much listening to sound quality to to make these reproduction repro products you know sound as clean and beautiful as possible you know and there's also something like i i've listened to some of our big power amplifiers and then like against a you know like a say let's just pick a hundred or 200 watt tube amplifier against a hundred or 200 watt, like a Hackler or, you know, just a good normal solid state amplifier or Bryston or something like that. And I just always would hear the tube set up just sound just so much more deeper. And it, it was really palpable and, and for, forceful sounding, very powerful sounding. Like you would blink your eyes at the impact, you know, if, if a, big wallop on a bass drum came or the symphony just went smack, you know, right. <laughs> the big loud noise or something like that. Like your eyes would blink. And whereas with the solid state amplifiers, I always heard them as very flat and two dimensional sounding. And it once, once you kind of uh, learn how to hear these things. And sometimes I think listening for this kind of stuff is not innate. I always say that like someone needs to sit you down and help you hear these things. Sometimes like I didn't know first time I, I had a compressor on my bench, I could mathematically see what it's doing, you know, input versus output, but I didn't know what I was supposed to be really listening for. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, I can hear that the volume is not changing, but what else, what else are you supposed to be hearing with the compressor? You know, 
what happens when the compressor sounds like an equalizer? Whoa, wh- where did the snare drum go? Why is, you know, why, why shouldn't I use that fast attack there? You know, that kind of thing. So um, a lot of those, those sorts of listening exercises, I definitely learned with other people, like yeah. playing something for me and saying, now listen to this when I do that. You know, like, oh, wow, check that out. Because I just didn't know that that level of listening existed. That's amazing. And yeah, I mean, you, you do have to make a point of actively trying to train your ears. I don't think it's like one of those things where you hear something one day and then a week or two later you hear another thing. And, and it's not always easy to remember those subtle differences. But when you hear things back back to back, like that's when you can really start to feel the differences. Like like you said, like that tube hits you a little harder than the solid state or that kind of thing, right? Sure. Imagine you're a kid and you've got two microphones and you stick one on the drum and one under the drum and you just mix them in. Like, you might not know what's going on there until someone says, hey, did you ever try flipping the phase on that channel? <laughs> and and then you might say, what's phase? Because you just don't know yet, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's really wonderful to, as a musician who's trying to get into recording, definitely work with others that know more than you do and start learning. You know, yeah, yeah you're you're not going to learn all that stuff in a vacuum. You might learn some of that stuff reading the forums, watching videos, reading books, and so on. But to collaborate with a mentor or mentors or work in an environment where you can just absorb all this kind of knowledge, it's it could be quite helpful. Absolutely. And, and if you're working with somebody, chances are they may already have a, a lot of different gear that you can listen to. It's, you know, it's not like you're just listening one piece at a time. They typically already have those kind of things. They already have that knowledge of, yeah, I prefer this piece of gear versus this piece of gear and for this reason and, and that kind of thing. And you can actually hear it because, um, yeah, I, I mean, Internet forums, you know, there, there's sometimes great advice on there and then sometimes horrible advice on there. Right. And, and everyone has their own buzzword for how they like to describe things, too. So it's it, there's a little bit of interpretation there sometimes, too, right? So Definitely. The, so the best way is to always just, like, actually listen and decide for yourself. And if you're having a hard time, like, what do you recommend for people who are maybe having a hard time hearing some of those subtle details? Because with things like compression, sometimes it it is very subtle, right? And, and I think compression is one of the things I always hear people talk about. Like, I'm not quite hearing what it's doing. You know, what do you recommend for people to be able to hear those subtle details between different, t- well, different pieces of gear. That, that's what I was explaining. Um, get a mentor of some type or hang out with someone who's been doing this longer than you have, or that knows more about this and, and ask, ask the questions and you'll find most people are happy to explain things and, and teach and, you know, share knowledge. Mm-hmm. And if they're not, go find someone else who's a nicer <laughs> person. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Again, I think the collaborative uh, effort will get you further than just, you know, wanking off in your bedroom. Yeah, of course. (laughs) (laughs) As it were. Yeah. Um, Earlier, you had mentioned the idea of even and odd order harmonic distortion. And I think that that's something that some people have no idea what that means. Can you describe the differences between the two and, and how you might be able to hear those as well? Yeah, I mean, technically, the difference, you know, if you're looking at your FFT graphs and so on, and uh, yeah, uh, verbally describing that stuff, um, one resource I've leaned on for decades would be John Atkinson's measurements in every issue of Stereophile, where he's measuring, you know, every piece of gear and he, on the audio precision, he's showing you the graphs and he's talking your way through the interpretation of those graphs. And that that's on the geeky side of things, but it's really, it's helped me learn over the years, you know, the effects of if you see that spike on that graph, it'll probably sound like that because he's describing that to you or he's, you know, interpreting it like probably what the reviewer heard when he said it sounded like this was this part of the measurements here. So that's, that's really on the geeky scale there. Um, but uh, the differences between those distortions, they start in the geeky world with measuring <laughs> things and math and those types of things. So if you are interested in in those, um, you got to get geeky with it. Yeah. And, and sonically, you said that one of them sounds a little nicer than the other, right? The even order harmonic structure that comes from single ended circuits does sound more 
pleasing, nicer, you know, again, when you're getting into distortion land, you know, it, they, they all sound more similar when they're running at normal levels. We're talking about extremes. Like if you're really, if you're pushing things more, but to be sure, it's a reason that the circuit in the manly variable mu sounds different from the circuit in the manly LOP because the variable mu is a little push pull amplifier in there and the LOP is single ended circuit. So mm. uh, the, the distortion products in the variable mu are going to be more on the odd order harmonic structure. But again, and that's why you can use that input control to kind of push it or not push it to try to evoke some of that in there which gotcha. yeah it's it's again it's subtle stuff um but it anyway yeah but i think you brought up a really good point there that a lot of times when you're running these things at normal levels it, the differences are very very small but it's when you really push them that you can you can really hear the differences there like i, I find that with a lot of preamps like most of them sound very very similar to start with but when you start driving them that's when you hear the different distortion characteristics and you that's get that right. different character out of it right yeah. And again, with vacuum tubes, you're, you're not running out of rail per se. So you're not going to get this abrupt like square wave as soon as you hit that voltage level, which you will get, you know, digital crunching, you know, I mean, it's all or nothing on in the digital world. If you're flipping, you're, it's flatlining and you're hearing that as a very nasty artifact. Um, and then with, with, uh, oh. You know, lower voltage solid state circuits. Again, there's not a ton to work with. And when you run out of juice there, you're going to hear it very abruptly. It's not going to be something you want to, you necessarily want to keep in your signal path, right? Of course. Yeah. So that's, that's a big advantage to high voltage tube circuits. And don't get fooled because there are some low voltage tube circuits <laughs> out there, but we're, I'm not engaged in any of that kind of atrocity. <laughs> nice well that kind of brings me to another point which is that it seems like there are so many different types of tubes out there and i think it could be a little confusing for people who have no clue what different models and different makes sound like or what they actually do or maybe what purpose they're for um could you possibly give us like a, a quick coles notes version of like some of the most popular models that might be out there and, and how they differ from each other well the good news is as a user or consumer you don't have to be concerned with the tube choice that's in there because the designers of the unit already put it in there for you. So you don't have to worry about it. When it's time to retube the unit, you want to pay, pay attention to the, the number that's in there. Use your owner's manual. You know, a, a 12AX7 is a very popular common tube. It's a little nine pin puppy, uh, it's got two triodes in it, and there are some other tubes that will plug in and function that have lower gain and so forth. And sometimes in a pinch, you can get away with another tube in there, especially if you have a lot of feedback on the circuit. Um, the differences between tube to tube are not going to be that dramatic, you know. Um, but, you know, as a, as, a, as a user, as a musician, as a recording engineer, you don't have to really worry about what tube they used in there that much. They put it in there for a reason. They did the engineering. They did the gain calculations, et cetera. It, that tube that they put in there works with all the resistor values that are around it and so on. So that's not your main worry. <laughs> your main worry is going to be like if the tube is malfunctioning or if it, it died or if it got really hissy or noisy, um, then you've got to start thinking about what are you going to replace it with. So in that case, um, you know, is it a tube that's easy to get? <laughs> is it a tube that's made today? Um, like a, like a 12 AX7, or is it some very obscure thing that you're going to pay hundreds of dollars for? Cause there's just not that many left on the planet. So that's, that's one thing you can look at there. Um, yeah. But other than that, I, I really wouldn't, I wouldn't get all anxious about what tube is already <laughs> in that unit. That's a very good point. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I hear people talk about like modifying gear all the time or trying out a different tube. And, you know, I'm always like, well, I feel like the gear was designed a certain way, you know. But. Yeah, I had a guy, a customer yesterday who says, oh, I have these 
six SU sevens, and can I use them instead of the six AL seven? Or I don't even know what the hell in in this preamp of yours. And I'm I didn't even go look on the internet what that <laughs> other tube was because you know we designed it around that the six SL seven or whatever. It's like I, I told him I'm said I said buddy you're on your own go research it you go figure it out. I've never encountered that tube in my life before so i've got nothing to be able to tell you mm -hmm. except i mean yes i could have gone and spent an hour to go look up the tube and try to figure it out but you know what i got other stuff i got to do because <laughs> just use the <laughs> tube that's in there <laughs> absolutely <laughs> this is what there was a tire there was a commercial like 25 years ago or something it's like the guy's going to buy tires for his cars and 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 the salesman's always trying to upsell them to these other tires. And the guy, he's like an older gentleman. He's like, I want ones like the ones on my car. <laughs> I just want ones like the ones on my car. And sometimes I wish that the people looking to substitute <laughs> tubes would just say, I just want ones like the ones in my unit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's a great commercial. I got to uh, check that out. <laughs> Do you remember that commercial? I, no, I, I don't, but I but I, I'm gonna definitely try to see if I can find something like that. I don't that, know that, yeah. what it was for. It was something like that. That's oh amazing. But it makes yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people think that by changing tubes they can get a different sound with their gear. Like, is that true or is it is there like is it just as simple as swapping out a tube and that should change the sound, or is there more to that process? Again, like I said, um, a, lo a lot of circuits have quite a lot of feedback around them. So the differences tube to tube are, are kind of mitigated, right? Mm -hmm. um, I also say another thing, like the more you spend on your, re on your replacement tube, the more you spend, the better it will sound because you spent all that money. So in your head, it's definitely going to sound better. <laughs> um, you know, because people don't like to admit that they were taken, you know, on eBay when they bought that. Eighty dollar twelve AX seven. That's not what it really says it is, you know. <laughs> that, and you got to be careful because when you're buying tubes out there, like on eBay or something like that, there there's a ton of what we call pulls, which are tubes that were in use in something for a long time, and then they were taken out and cleaned up with alcohol or Windex. Sometimes they're they're repainted. Sometimes they're they're re etched. You know, and a tube can be a total lie. And I've, I've seen that before where, you know, it's like, that's not an, that's not an RCA 7025 that doesn't exist. And it's not even a RCA 12AX7. You can look inside and see it's a Chinese 12AX7 that somebody has repainted with the 1970s RCA logo with the wrong color. And it says made in Yugoslavia. That just is, it's a lie on a thousand fronts, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I've got that tube here somewhere, actually. Um, but yeah, it's so funny because across the room, I looked at it and um, my friend was holding it up. I'm like, well, that's a chi Chinese 12AX7. And, but when you looked at the paint, you looked at the box and everything, you know, if you know what you're looking at, you can see that it's all bullshit. So, it's like wine. I mean, you don't know what's in that bottle till you open the bottle and taste it, right? Yeah. Unless you really, really know what you're looking at. Yeah. So if you're going to buy I mean, tubes, buy it from a reputable dealer. Label. Yeah. Yeah. So be careful about that because there's there's a lot of bullshit out there, a lot of unscrupulous, uh, unscrupulous sellers out there. So be careful. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that I know Manly does with a lot of the gear that you have, maybe all of the gear, is that you burn in your tubes. And I was curious to know, like, what does that do and why is that so important? Right. So when when we buy tubes, you know, they went through a, a quick burn in at the tube factory and uh, the initial flashing and then they're boxed up and they're. You do want to get some hours on them to burn them in. You're hoping that the any problems with the tubes will present themselves during the burn-in process and not afterwards when they've shipped halfway across the world again to your house and um the other the other part after burn-in we've got all kinds of special tube 
matching and batching fixtures and special test fixtures for uh, finding the best tubes for that circuit. So like the variable mu works best when all the triodes, you know, the plus and the minus part of the signal, when they're all balanced and matching each other, like you can get the fastest attack times if all, if the positive going uh, phase half of the circuit and the negative going phase half of the circuit are matchy matchy. Okay. So we have special jigs that determine if the two triodes that are inside that little bottle match really well. Hmm. So if they fail that test, um, that tube can still be used in a single ended circuit. That's like series, not parallel. Right. And so we're matching. It doesn't matter. Hmm. So the, all those jigs and things that we, we have are to optimize usage of these expensive tubes because we can't just buy a, a hundred tubes and throw away 90. Like, ah, they just didn't work for our circuit. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to go through them and say, oh, these ones are really good for microphones and these ones are really good for variable mute. And these ones are fine for the mic pre. And these other ones here could be output buffers because, you know, and then microphonics, that's another a uh, tube issue that that uh, younger folks don't uh, really know about. Microphonics is when you bang on the, you physically bang on the tube and you can hear it through the audio chain, meaning the tube structure itself is acting like a microphone and picking up vibrations mm. or in some, some extreme cases, even picking up your voice. So in that case, it it depends on like how it def if you can hear that or not depends on the extent of the microphony of the tube, meaning how loose are those structures in there. So like a tube with when they say like triple mica, things are like held together tighter. So hopefully they won't have such a, a lot of microphonics. Um, but it also depends how much gain is after that tube for how much you're amplifying the problem, right? So I remember getting called down in an emergency. Like I had a customer in Santa Monica. He called me down like, oh my God, this variable mute. It's so microphonic. And I went down there and he had his monitors, you know, all the way up and he had the gain cranked. He, he must have had 60 dBs of gain in the, in the monitoring chain after the 24 dBs of gain in the variable mute. So, yeah, you know what? You could stand next to the variable mu and talk into its faceplate and hear it through the speakers. Sure. But if you had hit play on the tape machine, it would have sent those speakers into Orange County. You know what I mean? <laughs> it would have launched them. Yeah. It's a, that was a, it was an unrealistic situation. And so, you know, be careful. I mean, yeah, if you put a big enough microscope after anything, you're going to see the worst problems or if, if you take your macro lens and look at a solder joint you might think oh my god that's terrible but in real life you're you're just looking at it way too closely you know so Love it. um <laughs> keep keep everything in reasonable normal regions yeah. you know and and adjust your expectations accordingly Love that that's great you had mentioned earlier that um you you mainly tend to cater to both the pro audio world and the audiophile market. And I'm just wondering, like, how do you define the differences between those two markets? Like, is there a crossover? Is there like one of the biggest differences? Well, in general, the audiophiles are just playing back music, you know, through fancy speakers and playing records. And, and in general, the recording people have microphones and they're creating music. So uh, tonally speaking, I mean, we originate with pretty much the same flavor, but on the recording side, because we're creating tone, that's when, you know, we, we can allow something to be a little more influential and less neutral in its sound on purpose, you know. However, sometimes like we'll give you a choice, like in the, say, the massive passive. You can listen to it with the transformers or come out the quarter inch jacks and listen to it without the, or come in the quarter inch jack and listen to it without the input transformer, for instance. So you can listen to it with 
with or without the transformer. Same in the Vox box, like all the quarter inch ins and outs of the Vox box, those are transformer less. So you can get a cleaner sound if you go out of those versus the XLRs that are all transformer coupled. So the transformer gives you this kind of bigger, rounder, meatier sound. But that may or may not be appropriate for what you're doing. Good news is you got some cables, just plug them in and see what you like the sound of best. So in the in the pro audio world, we allow for tone creation or neutrality. In the audiophile world, we're really going for neutrality. Neutrality, but you know, really involving sounding. And again, like I mentioned, the 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 front to back back depth, you know, and then this other imaging and placement and all that kind of thing those are typical sonic sonic features that we listen for more when we're developing the hi-fi gear as opposed to the pro audio equipment but in true fact a lot of these circuits go back and forth like you know they're pretty similar circuits used in the audio file stuff and the pro audio stuff um I'd say where those two worlds really converge would be in the mastering studio. And when I'm doing critical listening here in LA, I'll frequently, you know, haul down a prototype to a mastering studio where they've got a really good listening set up and a, a very neutral, good sounding, you know, playback system. And then I can really hear the detail of the circuit I'm trying to listen to. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. I love that description and how you separated, like how you distinguish the two markets, because I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, one is definitely more of the creative side and the other is just like, let me listen to this at the highest fidelity. And that, that's really what it comes down to, right? Yeah. 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 Um, I'd also love to talk a little bit about equalizers. And that's something you guys obviously make as well. Um, what makes one EQ unit different than another? Um, cause I yeah, think a lot of people always think it's just like, you know, dial in a frequency and hit some gain, right? Like that's, that's the controls we see, but there's obviously a lot more under the hood that makes a manly EQ different than an EVQ or something like that. Right. Yeah. We're, we're primarily based in the passive EQ followed by gain makeup world. Those are most of our equalizers are working in that type of circuit. The EQ in the core is a Baxendall. That's an active op amp based EQ. And that's that's different. But the core, remember, is half the price of the Vox box. So that's why uh, the passive EQ stuff, it, it's you've got chokes, resistors and capacitors and switches and pots. And it's way more expensive to do that than than an os, than than using an op amp. Um, those chokes especially get expensive really quick. So when you have a, a, what you call a passive equalizer. You go through a network. It's, it's, you know, filtering the frequencies out. Um, it's not creating any new frequencies or boosting anything. Everything's level and you're either cutting some or cutting more <laughs> to be, you know, the cutting some would be the zero point on the equalizer and the cutting more would be your cut point on the equalizer. I mean, not cutting at all would be your boost point on the equalizer. You see what I mean? Gotcha. So. After you've, you've done that, you, you might have lost 20 dBs of gain. And then you have to follow that by, by, uh, reamplifying the signal back up to the level. So that's how, that's just generally speaking, how a passive EQ works, like a Poltec EQ or like our massive passive equalizer. Um, you know, massive passive, it's got two sets of filters in the middle of it. Um, the regular recording version of the massive passive, the filters are more in the middle of the frequency range. So you can use them for making, uh, making tone effects like a telephone sound. Like mm. if you filter out everything on the extremes, you know, it'll sound like this, right? And you use that as an effect when you're creating music. If you were using that massive passive in an audio file playback situation or a mastering situation, you'd want to use the mastering version. Because the filters are way on the outsides for solving problems like, oh, my God, a subway rumble just got into my record. I need to filter that out. So, you know, the, the filters are dealing with the real low frequency stuff and then the real high frequency stuff. 
to I solve problems, not to create tone. So that that's another another difference, you know, between audiophile world and pro audio world. That's that's actually a perfect example right there of just like what where one might use one versus the other and and why. And, and it makes sense. It's like you're you're the regular version of the massive passive is catered to the people who are trying to be the creative people that are shaping the sounds and the mastering person isn't really isn't really doing that. They're just kind of cleaning up and preparing it for release and making sure that those hi-fi people love it, love the sound of it. So it's like, let them have that piece of gear that shapes the sound for those people, right? <laughs> yeah. Or as part of the creative process, you know, you might want that vocal to sound like, you know, she's singing through a telephone. Fair. That might be the choice of what you're going for there. Yeah. So that's cool. What about um, different models of compression? Like I know you mainly has a few different models of compressors out there. What what is it about different models that it, what is it about different models that people should be paying attention to when when purchasing a compressor? Uh, there's a couple different types of compressors out there. Um, the Manly Variable Mu is a tube based compressor where the tube is rebiased to change how much it's amplifying dynamically with the music, you know. Um, the old Fairchild worked that way. Um, there's uh, tubes that use a FET to do that. I mean, there's, sorry, compressors that use a FET to do that. Uh, An 1176 is a very famous FET compressor. Those are uh, usually a lot faster on the attack than a tube compressor could be um, or tube limiter. Um, but yeah, by the way, compressors are usually lower ratio dynamic controlled devices and a limiter would be a higher ratio, like a 10 to one or something like that. Um, there's, uh, you know, I, they, they all have different sonic characteristics. Sometimes it's, it's a good idea to use one and follow it by another. I think the best way that um, people these days can kind of compare general sounds of how these all sound different and what they do to the sound is just use your plugins. They're nearly free and you can turn the dials all day long and get, get an idea of it. It's like a demo version of the real thing. <laughs> and you can explore the differences of, of these various dynamic control devices on your own time. That's fair. And, and Manly has got into the plugin world as well. So I know you have your universal audio collaboration there. So yeah, yes. absolutely. It's a great way to, to try out the gear and get a sense of, you know, what, what can this do? Is this the right tool for my, for my project? That kind of thing. Yeah. I, I it's a larger topic. I think that we're going to discuss <laughs> it because we're almost out of time here, yeah. but um, yeah, use, use those, Use the resources you've got there um, and listen with your ears, listen with your buddies and, and see what you see, what you're hearing the difference about, you know, because the different timing characteristics. It just it's it's really hard to describe all this stuff, really. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, without going into a recording class and I am not a recording engineer, so I'm going to bow out at that point. <laughs> But you, but you're the one that's like making this, making the products that, that people are using. So you, I think you, I think you have a much more trained ear than maybe you give yourself credit for. I have, I have developed a good trained ear and thank you. And, um, but again, I, I've done, I've developed that, you know, listening with mastering engineers and recording engineers and people that have more experience than I did at the time, you know, and, and, you know, so go collaborate with your buddies and go listen to stuff yeah that kind of brings it all full circle here you know just collaborating paying attention um listening i i I think this is this is great and i think people are gonna love this episode um if people want to learn more about you and and manly gear what's the what's the best way for them to do that oh well head on over to our website www.manly.com m-a-n-l-e-y awesome right on and is there any uh Maybe maybe I shouldn't be asking this question, but is there any new stuff coming out possibly in the near future that we can? Oh, expect? someday, <laughs> someday. We've been working on some hi-fi preamplifiers for a few years now, and you know we're we're very precise and exacting with our our expectations, and um, 
you know, we might spend several months just working on a really badass mono circuit, you know, which would be boring for most people to keep track of, but it's just got to be awesome. Everything in the unit's got to be great. So we're working on a couple more preamps right now. And in the pro audio world, um, we've been getting our new power supply and some of our legacy products like the Vox Box and Mass Passive and all the microphones. And that's taking quite a lot of engineering to work out all that stuff as well. But uh, we we keep trying to hire more people to get more stuff done. So <laughs> if you've got some skills, let us know. Yeah. And definitely listen back to the beginning of this interview when we talked about, you know, making yourself uh, put, making yourself known there. Anyone who anyone who fails to do that, they're, they're cut right away. So <laughs> Right on. Well, well, Ivana, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I, I really appreciate it. Cool, Mike. Thanks so much. It was fun. No problem. So that was my interview with Ivana Manley, and that was great. I thought she gave us a lot of great insight into some of the equipment that Manley makes and some of the differences between uh, different types of tubes and uh, different compressors and EQs and, you know, how it all comes together to get you the clean sound or the, the distorted sound that you want. So I just thought it was really cool. I know she got into some technical stuff that, you know, for some people who might not be uh, technical minded or engineering based, you know, some of these tools that she was throwing out might go over your head, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, really what it comes down to is kind of what she said of just listening and taking the time to identify the differences between one piece of gear versus another and identifying whether that's the sound that you want in your music or not. And you don't really have to worry about all of the technical stuff that goes into manufacturing this gear or how it was all spec'd out and designed. You know, at the end of the day, it really just comes down to the quality of sound. But having a sense of what goes into it is definitely important. And that's one reason why I wanted to have her on the show today, because I thought that, you know, it would give us a good insight into what really goes behind the gear that we buy and, and that we use on a regular basis inside of the studio. So I hope that you found that episode helpful. I hope that it gave you some good insight into, you know, selecting the right gear for you and uh, understanding a little bit more about the background of some of this equipment. So if you enjoyed that episode, definitely make sure to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or whatever podcast platform you listen to. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live each and every Wednesday morning. We've got a ton of great interviews lined up, so definitely you're going to want to listen to those as they come out. And uh, the best way to do that is to subscribe. So make sure to do that. And also make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com. That is where I help out musicians with creating pro sounding recordings from their home studios. And on that website, I've got so many resources designed to help make that process really easy easy for you. One of which that you're going to want to check out is called The Mixing Mindset. That is a book that I put out a while ago that became an Amazon number one bestseller. And inside of that book, I walk you through the step-by-step -step process for mixing your songs from home and what to listen for, what tools to use, what to be boosting, what to be cutting, when to be using compression, when to be using effects, and all of the stuff that you need to know. That way you make sure that you don't miss out on any steps. And this is going to make it super simple and super straightforward for you and give you a solid workflow to follow so that you're not feeling scatterbrained throughout that whole process. So once again, check that out. It's called The Mixing mindset and it's available at masteryourmix.com. So that is it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed that and we'll talk soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit masteryourmix.com.